Hello and welcome back to Planetos Podcast for episode 37, Winter's Lady, a discussion on Alice Karstark. Love it, love it, love it. She's a great, great minor character. I'm so looking forward to our discussion about her here tonight. So we continue our long, long, slow march to the winds of winter, and we are so glad that you could join us. And like I said, we have a really great episode planned for you. Uh, again, another fascinating character, just a really beloved minor character in A Song of Ass and Fire, um, who really comes out of nowhere in late, late in A Dance with Dragons and has just kind of uh, taken the fandom by storm. Uh, everybody loves this character. We'll, we're going to talk tonight about her will um, talk a little bit about uh, who she is. We'll uh, discuss um, her arc in the chapters. We will um, do some theory crafting about her and we'll talk about some symbolism of the new house that she creates, House Thin. Um, and uh, we'll also talk about the symbolism of her marriage, which is really interesting, really important, and one of the more lighthearted um, events in A Song of Ice and Fire. You know, Micah, you've talked about this in the past. We don't get too many happy moments in A Song of Ice and Fire, and this seems to be one of them. So I am one of your hosts, Travis. You can find me on Twitter at Sir underscore Travis. I'm another one of your hosts, Brett. You can find me on Twitter at Homely Pillow. And I'm the third of your hosts, Micah, and you can find me on Twitter at Micah underscore of Clark. All right. So, Micah, we, we, you know, last episode we talked about my minor character. Next episode we'll talk about Brett's minor character, but you chose Alice Carstark. Why did you choose Alice Carstark? A uh, couple reasons, but uh, one of them being, as you said, everyone loves Alice Karstark, and yeah, she's just really great, and there's a lot that I have to talk about her, And but she also stands in for a really big theme in Song of Ice and Fire and How George Writes is the breaking of social boundaries, in that she is given an arranged marriage by her great-uncle, Arnolf from Fleas to a uh, or Commander Jon Snow to try and get out of it, in which she succeeds and she is married to none other than a member of the Free Folk, the wildling fen known as Sigorn the Magnar. So it's a pretty big statement in that theme of breaking social boundaries. So I figured for that theme, why not represent it better than with Lady Alice Karstark? Yeah, I think she's a great character. She is so strong-willed. Um, she immediately has this 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 presence at the wall um, that um, is just again. You know, she comes out of nowhere, and you're you're like, where did this where did this character come from? Where did this this young woman uh, come from? Um, and, you know, kind of really not only becomes one of our favorite minor characters, but potentially, potentially could have uh, a really heartwarming ending by series end. If we if we hear what happens to please, if what happens to her and her new husband and the family that she's likely to create. Um, is positive let's let's please hope that the others don't just <laughs> just kill uh her um like, like it, apparently happened in the show i mean she just kind yeah. of disappeared in the show. <laughs> like what where did she go <laughs> anyways so again we're gonna we'll, we'll talk about the character we'll talk about some of the symbolism around her and then we'll we'll wrap up the episode by discussing some uh, there's not too many theories that that surround Alice, but there's some discussion that we can really get to uh, on some symbolism around her. So Alice is the only daughter of the late Lord Rickard Karstark. Of course, we know that Rickard Karstark was the one who 
uh, killed uh, the two Lannister cousins in Rob's camp, and and Rob, of course, uh, beheads him in a storm of swords for that betrayal. Now, Alice is described as tall, skinny, cultish, cultish, which means energetic but awkward in movement and behavior, like a colt, you know, a a young male horse. She has brown hair, which she weaves into a braid, and she's described as having a small bosom. George loves to describe <laughs> women's uh, uh, bosoms for some reason. Uh, she is pale with a long face, pointy chin, blue-gray eyes, and small ears. She reminds Jon Snow of Arya, and I think that's really important because that um, that is v- – that's <coughs> integral to why John does some of the things he does um, when she comes begging for help. Uh, Alice is almost as old as John, so she's probably around 16 years old or something like that. Now, when she was six years old, Alice visited Winterfell with her lord father, uh, and Rickard Karstark urged her to charm Rob Stark in the hopes of arranging a betro- betrothal between Stark and Karstark. She danced that night with Rob and deemed him courteous, but she also danced with Jon Snow, who she remembered as Solon. Before the start of A Game of Thrones, she is betrothed to Darren Hornwood, the heir of Hornwood. Uh, but they are waiting for Alice to flower before the marriage. In A Game of Thrones, Darren Hornwood and two of Alice's brothers, Eddard and Torin Karstark, are killed by Sir Jamie Lannister at the Battle of the Whispering Wood. Her eldest brother, Harrion, who is heir to Carhold, is captured at the Battle of the Green Fork and taken to Heron Hall. In A Storm of Swords, Lord Rickard Karstark promises Alice's hand in marriage to the person who brings him Sir Jamie Lannister after the Kingslayer escapes. The sellsword Vargo Hote is the one who captures Jamie and cuts off his hand, hoping to gain the lordship of Carhold. Of course, we know what happens to Vargo Hote, and we know that Rob uh, takes off Lord Karstark's head for murdering, uh, as I said, the Lannister cousins. Willem Lannister and Tion Frey. Alice's brother Harrion is released at Harrenhal when Roos Bolton takes over the castle, but he is sent to attack Duskendale, where he is captured by Lord Randall Tarley's forces, I believe. In A Dance with Dragons, Alice Karstark has flowered at Carhold, and her great uncle Arnolf Karstark, Castellan of Carhold, plans to wed Alice to his son. Kriegen Karstark. Arnulf declares his support for King Stannis Baratheon in the hopes the Iron Throne will execute Harrion Karstark, Alice's last surviving brother and captive of the Lannisters at Maidenpool. They really move poor Harrion Karstark around mm-hmm. a lot as a prisoner. To avoid marrying her cousin Kriegen Stark, she, uh, Alice flees to the Wall and the protection of Lord Commander Jon Snow. Alice is found by two members of the Night's Watch in <coughs> Molestown, weak atop a dying horse. She's brought to Maester Aemon's chambers at Castle Black, fulfilling, and I'm quoting around that, fulfilling Melisandre's <laughs> vision of a gray girl on a dying horse riding for the wall to escape an arranged marriage. Now, John thinks that Melisandre's vision was about Arya, and he has had previously dispatched Mance and the Spearwives to rescue her from Winterfell. Alice uh, reveals to Jon Snow that Arnolf Karstark is in league with Roose Bolton, and Arnolf plans to betray Stannis when the king reaches Winterfell. Jon sends a raven to Stannis, warning him about the Karstark betrayal. The day after Alice arrives at Castle Black, Cregan Karstark arrives and is imprisoned in the ice cells by Jon Snow. Sir Patrick of King's Mountain 
uh, a member of the Queen's Men, uh, the Queen being Selyse Baratheon, wants Alice's hand in marriage, but John weds her to Sigorn, the Magnar of Thin, creating a new noble house, House Thin, with a claim to Carhold if Harrion dies. Two of Cregan's men go over to Alice and believe Carhold will open its gates to her and Sigorn's 200 men. The marriage ceremony is performed by Melisandre, and we're going to discuss that uh, a little later because there's, like we said, some really great symbolism and some potential foreshadowing in the ritual. The chapter ends with a large feast at Castle Black where Alice asks John to dance with her. Uh, that doesn't happen, unfortunately. That, that would have been a great little uh, scene of John and Alice dancing again. But uh, they share some mulled wine, and John uh, watches her dance awkwardly with her new husband, Sigourn. In the Theon ch uh, sample chapter from The Winds of Winter, uh, we learn uh, that Stannis uh, has received the letter about Arnolf Karstark's um, uh, betrayal uh, from Jon Snow, and he <coughs> has Arnolf Karstark and his grandsons uh, arrested injuring some of them in the process. Stannis promises them a swift death if they cooperate or if they don't, they'll be burned alive. So before we uh, talk about some of the symbolism, we just want to give some context for House Karstark because I think this is this is important to understand. The Karstarks uh, rule from Carhold, which is in the eastern part of the north, just south of the Bay of Seals and the island of Skagos. The house was founded about a thousand years ago. Um, the text says around 700 years before Aegon's conquest. Uh, they are a cadet branch of House Stark. They're da uh, dating back to Carlin Stark, a younger son of Winterfell. The castle that Carlin built, which sets upon a promontory amid a forest and, a, and along a river, uh, and is described as strong but smaller and meaner than Harrenhal, was originally called Carl's Hold. But over time, it developed into Carhold, and this branch of the Starks became Karstarks. Karstarks are described as big, fierce men. They're long-haired, uh, they have big beards, uh, their hair is brown, they have blue-gray eyes, uh, they wear thick cloaks of seals and wolves and bears. Uh, like the northern mountain clans, the older men of Carhold and their lands leave in winter to ease the burden on the younger generations. Now, the Karstark sigil is a white sunburst on black, and their motto is the Sun of Winter. When Rob Stark calls his banners to march south, Lord Karstark arrives at Winterfell with 300 horse and almost 2,000 foot, which really shows their importance and power as a principal vassal house uh, to House Stark. So some of the foreshadowing that surrounds Alice Karstark really comes in um, her marriage to Sigourn. Um, but it really sort of lands, um, the foreshadowing kind of lands at John's feet because he does some really, he makes some really interesting moves, um, some very political moves here, um, that really spell his doom in the end. Uh, you know, what he does with Alice Karstark, what he does, um, you know, in marrying her to Sigourney is not the reason the Night's Watch executes him, but it's one of the contributing factors. So, you know, like we said, in John's chapters in A Dance with Dragons, he is reminded of his sister Arya when he sees Alice. She looks like Arya. Uh, she's strong-willed like Arya. And so he and so John immediately has a desire to save her. Um, he, you know, throughout his chapters in A Dance with Dragons, he's thinking about his family. He's thinking about all that he's lost. He's longing for them. Um, he has this impulse to protect 
the innocent. Um, he has a temptation not only for revenge against the Boltons, but John wants to become Lord of Winterfell. He wants to be a Stark. He wants to play the Game of Thrones. Um, and all of this is occurring, um, and it's really a betrayal of his Night's Watch oath. <coughs> and, of course, he uses the watch and the wall to protect Alice and to arrest Cregan Karstark when he arrives to demand Alice back. John plays matchmaker for a northern lord's daughter. Um, he holds the wedding at Castle Black. He gives away the bride. He allows a foreign priestess to conduct the ritual. Uh, he sends important information gained from Alice uh, to Stannis so uh, the one true king can survive and retake Winterfell. And who does he does all the, you know, who, who benefits from all of these moves that John um, makes? It's House Stark. This is, the, you know, this is emblematic of uh, John longing for his family, longing for his home, um, and longing to do everything he can to uh, not only seek revenge on those who wronged, um, but protect protect the the. Uh, the innocence, like we said, uh, and that's really important. That, that you know, we're not criticizing what John does, but you have to understand that he's Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, and and this is completely out of his purview. Um, and, and it really contributes to what happens to him at the end of A Dance of Dragons. But no one, no one wants to see Alice Carstark hurt. I mean, that you know, like nobody wants to see that us the readers don't want to see that so I, I think our discussion tonight should really focus on what i'm calling the marriage of ice and fire it it, it it is riddled with this symbolism it's so good this is such a good sequence um that george um puts in here it's john 10 from A Dance with Dragons. It starts with the ceremony. It ends with a feast. Again, it is one of the only happy moments we get in, in the series. And, you know, we, we, we get quite a few happy moments, but we don't get a whole chapter that's just this rich and this lovely. Um, and I think we really, we really need to discuss it here. So... The first bit of symbolism that we get, and I want you guys to jump in here, is ice and fire. We're, you know, I said we're calling it the marriage of ice and fire, but there is this meld of northern traditions uh, and foreign customs. You know, the northern traditions not only include um, what happens presumably beyond the wall but but what the um what the starks and the car starks are used to um in a way but but there's a lot of i think perhaps lord of light ritual in this relore ritual in this i mean they're jumping over a pit of fire um <laughs> they're you know, it's 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 almost like a church service. Uh, I mean, you know, that rereading the chapter earlier today, I was I was surprised at at how there's not little from the bride and groom, but of course Melisandre makes a show out of everything. Yeah, yeah. But there's there are chants, there are uh you know, the Salise and all of her men are, are saying things back to Melisandre. I mean, wh what what do you all think about, um, you know, this sequence itself? It, it it's it's literally this fire, this pit of fire, which is struggling. It's struggling in this chapter against the cold wind. Um, you've got the wall behind. You've got shadows uh, being cast. 
uh, not not the shadows that Melisandre cast <laughs> earlier in the series, but you know shadows from from the fire and and the flames. Um, and I think there's a lot of symbolism here for what it's really going to take to overcome the long night coming together. You know, these, these traditions that the North and the free folk have the traditions that R'hllor has, but quite literally gathering around the fire, staying warm, um, you know, binding yourselves together. I think that's what's going to, what's, what is going, what it's going to take to overcome the long night in the end. Yeah. I, yeah. You got, do you got anything, Micah? I got uh, just a broader addition to what Travis was saying about it unifying. Cause you got, th- you got three different things coming in to play here is the, uh, the Relorites of the uh, Melisandre and her big old show she's putting on. But you also have the Fen traditions, which are really old first men uh, traditions are coming together for the ceremony and also the traditional Northmen of Westeros' uh, traditions coming in with Alice Karstark's side. So you really have these big groups are coming together for this, and there's only really one small rejection, and that's uh, Septon Selador when he just, like, nopes out right out of the ceremony <laughs> as soon as he looks at it. But, uh, yeah, it's it really is just one big unity of all these things that are building up the fire and keeping everybody warm in this whole thing. Uh, Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't have said it better. Uh, I I do find it weird though, that Melisandre is conducting this whole thing when it could be very much a, a really Northern ceremony, but instead they go with the, and it might be because, the septum didn't want anything to do with it because John's playing in politics now. But yeah, I just thought that stuck out to me. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, septum Celador, I think is, is the guy's name. Um, he, he doesn't like John. I mean, I think that's pretty evident from the text. Um, he doesn't agree with many of the decisions John makes elsewise you know not just not just this but um in a number of other areas he he doesn't uh um support john's decision making um so you could see why he probably wouldn't yeah. participate in this um i think there's also well go ahead oh i well i just had a thought like, how did Northerners usually get married? Because I, I know sep- septums are more, those are p- more Southern things and, you know, the seven sort of thing. So I don't, I don't know if there's been a, I don't know, like who's in charge of that. I don't I know if that's. the uh, Lord of the Holdfast would probably be the uh, one okay. who usually takes that spot. Oh, so maybe, yeah, so yeah, maybe it just had to be Melisandre. I guess the only northern marriage we see in the text is Ramsay's marriage to fake Arya. Um, And I don't really remember how that goes down. Let me just look here real quick. I think he has a sept in there. Yeah. I can't remember. It's been it's been a long time since I've read that chapter. It's usually not the part that I remember about the wedding. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let me, let me just, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, um, oh God! The, I just, Mostly, it's just visceral that, hatred, of Ramsey. But yeah, well, that too. But the way it ends, Jesus Christ! Oh, now I feel terrible. That's a really good point, Brett. You know really the only chapter that we get um, where a northern marriage is happening um, is Ramsey to fake Arya. Um, and Micah, you know, as as you said, that there may be a Septon involved there. Um, but, you know, we, we, we don't know what the northern custom is. I think there's, there's also the, 
the fact that there's probably because Salise is there, there's probably definitely a royal decree. I mean, you, oh you, yeah, you can see Salise saying, "Oh no, no, no." Okay, Sandra will yeah. do this I, I don't, ceremony. I I feel so I feel so terrible because you know the the one true king. I didn't see that angle, so yeah. yeah. So that 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 makes sense in my mind is why she did it because now it's they're considering it that and it's by the the king and queen and yeah right so I mean yeah it, it's I think that probably has a lot more to do with it plus John is supporting Stannis's cause so he's he's making a political decision here which is just I, again I'm not I'm not criticizing. John as a as a as a person I, because I've, I'm like yes Jon Snow do that you know put these two together create a um a force that's loyal to House Stark and you know we want to see Alice Car Stark but as Lord Commander you're like buddy this is not your role this is a yeah he's this like is a noble family that the Lord Commander should not be. Mary I, I feel that's that I mean, but that makes a lot of sense why he dressed it up so much like Stannis that, was doing it. Yes, that's that's a good yeah. point. I mean, that there could be something to that. Um that, you know, I wasn't the one um that came up well, with the ceremony. I'm not the one that that made them do this. One of the one of one of the things too I caught was when the uncle or more of a cousin, whatever, great uncle, whatever, whatever he is to Alice Karstark, when he shows up, th there's the talk about, you know, the one of the crossbowmen shot at him and then they killed the crossbowmen before they captured him. I wonder if that's just like him trying to like justify in his mind or like what happened. Could that be a bit of like a... um unreliable narrator type thing going on like uh in john's mind so yeah where he's like now now you're killing people <laughs> over this so i don't know yeah mikey you had you had some thoughts on that didn't you oh uh, yeah uh basically what brett said but yeah kind of adds on to John's reasoning for arresting Cragen is instead of, well, I'm trying to protect this noble person that, given my station, I shouldn't be protecting, but from a character standpoint, yes, please. Uh, that, yeah, he shot at one of my guys, so he's being arrested. So it's, it's, John is justifying it. It's, it's justification. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like, it's justification. And I didn't, I didn't hold him because, he came for Alice. I held him because they shot at one of my guys and he's responsible as, as the Lord or whatever. Um, he's responsible for what his men do. And well, yeah. and it's not even described at like how the situation goes down. That could have been an accidental loose. They could have snuck up on them right. and scared them. You know, it, th there's just nothing to it. So yeah. Yeah. It's really quick. Like, like yeah. you said, you could have been using it as an excuse. Right, right. Um, you know, now we said just a few minutes ago that that perhaps John lets Melisandre run this ritual so he can have plausible deniability of saying, you know, well, it 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 it, it was Salise, it was Stannis, it was those uh, queensmen and kingsmen that that came up with a ceremony, but John participates in it. Um, he's the one that gives Alice away. Now, that's some important symbolism for for a couple of reasons. You've got the fact that John is the Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, but he also rode with the Wildlings. So there's a unity of these two institutions that have hated each other for thousands of years. It's a really big deal um, that the Lord commander would do this, that it, there's just, uh, you know, this bitter, terrible history, uh, even between not just the night's watch and the wildlings, but the North and the wildlings. So 
Jon Snow, Jon Stark, however you want to describe him in this context, he's giving her away. So this is a northerner giving a northern girl away to a wildling prince, if you will, uh, the Magnar of Finn. Um, this is also personal reconciliation, personal reconciliation between Lord Commander Jon Snow uh, and the Thins because Sigourn's father, uh, Steer, was killed in the assault on the wall. Uh, so you can kind of see some symbolism there as well mm -hmm. uh, that – you know, this is this is reconciliation on all these fronts, the Night's Watch and the Free Folk, North and the Free Folk, and Jon Snow personally and the Thins. Um, there's also some really interesting light and in dark. Um, you know, beyond Melisandre talking about the you know, the warmth of the fire, the, the, the burning of the fire is, is, um, you know, what will keep everyone safe in these dark times. House Karstark sigil, as we said, is a white sun, a white sun on black. So it's, it's a white sun amidst this black night. So there's a, there's a lot of symbolism there of the sun rising the sun coming up, the, 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 the power of light in darkness. Um, you know, it relates very much to the ice and fire symbolism. Um, you know, this unity, this coming together of Karstark and Thin, it, it creates not just a new house, but it has the potential to create new life uh, with Alice and Sigourn as husband and wife. Um, and that's, that's what stops death. Life stops death. You know, perpetuating ourselves is, is what keeps uh, humanity going, our society going. And so this is really important, especially in the context of the coming of the long night. And then I think one of the last points that's really important here is the reunification of Stark and Karstark. I mean, as we said before, there is are thousands of years of ties between these two families. Um, they share similar names. Um, they are, they car Starks are Starks. Um, they just changed their name because over a number of years, that's just how it developed. Um, but in the main series, we see a big divergence between these two families. When Rickard Karstark betrays Rob Stark, Ooh. And Rob has to kill him. And the Karstark soldiers leave. They abandon Rob's cause. And that really hurts Rob's chances of winning. Of course, the Red Wedding happens. Um, and the Karstarks then support Bruce Bolton <clears throat> in the Iron Throne. Um, but Alice could really be the Karstark that brings these two houses back together any thoughts on on uh that stuff um no i i agree with it i i don't think i have much to add to it okay um oh um, yeah not much to add to that uh it's a really great symbol of what is probably going to come towards the end of dream of spring with the unification of all these cultures that have been so separated by literal walls. Yeah. I'm not much to add there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, no, there's a, there's a big fat wall that, that <laughs> quite literally separates, uh, these, these, um, these people. And so that, that yeah. it, it is definitely like just that the whole wedding is definitely like really interesting just because of, You've got, I mean, first of all, the Night's Watch, I mean, that's basically what the Night's Watch is. Just, they come from all over, and they have to learn to to work together. So it's weird that, like, a lot of the Night's Watch have a problem with the Wildlings, um, just because they've, and I think John sees that, and that's why he's, but, um, 
but then you're just even more, more people are mixing. Um, cause you got the, you know, the Queensmen, I'm sure there's some Kingsmen there. Um, so I don't know. It's just interesting. Yeah. No, you're right. I mean, uh, of all the institutions, the Night's Watch should uh, should be able to put aside petty differences. But, but, they, but they can't. <laughs> they can't because they've been indoctrinated mm-hmm. that, you know, their enemy is the wildlings. And when that's really not their enemy, they've just, you know, over thousands of years, they've lost sight of what, of what the focus has been. And it's really indicative of, you know, I mean, George does it so well. The institution is falling apart. The wall, the castles are falling apart. Um, I mean, there's, there's a reason he does that um, Mm -hmm. to, to, you know, say, look, I showed you it's physically falling apart. You know, you need to realize that figuratively it's also falling apart because they've, they've, um, they've lost sight of their mission. Well, it, it's, it's really funny too, because I mean, you, you, it's right in front of their face, but yeah, it's just like you said, they, they've been indoctrinated. They, they just refuse to want to see the truth of the, right. their situation. Um, cause if that falls apart, that's probably something new, unheard of, like what's next, you know, there's always a sense of, what's next but when the whole system's falling apart that's right you know but but yeah it's interesting yep so the the final thing that comes from this chapter um is the creation of a new house house thin so house thin is the new noble house that is created by the unity of alice karstark and Sigorn, the Magnar of Thin, and it's really a meld of wildling and northern cultures. And I just want to I just want to close out today with a discussion on its um, sigil, the sigil that's created, um, that, that that's created from this bond, and shaped by all of these these as we've discussed here today of all of these traditions, these customs, these religions, these people coming together, you know, quite literally craft this new sigil. Um, and it becomes very symbolic of, of what house thin or Alice Karstark's house Karstark will mean to the North. So the, um, the, the sigil is a bronze disc surrounded by red flames on a white field. So you have the bronze of the thins, the red to honor R'hllor, and the white sunburst of Karstark. All three combine to not only resemble the Karstark sigil, but to create a new sun, a spring sun at dawn. This this golden sun rising with red flames around it. Um, and it's going to rise in spite of the long night. I think what's, what's really important to take away from this new sigil. Um, you know, one of the other things that should make everyone out there happy, who's a fan <coughs> of this car Stark is their, there are Westerosi customs that Sigorn could take the name Karstark. Uh, you know, Alice is the one with the claim to Carhold, not Sigorn. Um, so it's quite possible that he will go by Sigorn Karstark, which I think is is pretty cool. Um, additionally, the thins of all of the free folk are the wildlings that are most akin to the first men. Now, all of the free folk have the blood of the first men in them, but the customs and traditions of the Thins are so like the customs and traditions of the Northern Lords. They have titles, they have laws, um, and, um, you know, I think 
what really contributes to that is that where the thins come from is this valley that is surrounded by mountains. So it, it's been sort of isolated. So this first men culture that was predominant all over the North has survived up there beyond the wall. And that's what kind of sets the thins um, apart. And so I think that this is just a really fascinating fusion of not only two cultures, but two characters. Um, and I think that let's all hope that Alice and Sigourn have a long, happy life um, and are part of the efforts to kind of rebuild Westeros. You know, it kind of reminds me of our discussion on House Blackwood, where mm-hmm. we kind of hypothesized that a Bracken and a Blackwood could come together. Um, and at the series end, we could find out that the Blackwoods and the Brackens, the feud has been resolved and they're united and there's a, a child on the way and a, a Blackwood and a Bracken have wed each other. Um, you kind of see the symbolism here that a Northern house and a free folk house coming together to put aside differences and showing, showing the rest of their society that there's a better way. Yes. Um, I mean, it might, I mean, it seems like it might be just, well, it probably is like one of the major themes of like the entire story. I mean, Danny's, arc is completely like that you know throughout just trying you know putting together people that don't normally you know aren't normally together and then they making them work together um but yeah um but yeah i don't know it's a it's a great chapter um i well oh yeah and we can't we can't forget about her um help help me john snow you're my you're my only hope right. uh yeah. moment uh i wonder if george was watching star wars the day he uh wrote that or came up with that quote <laughs> promise me lord snow yeah. promise me john <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah you're my only hope john snow yeah I mean, even if he wasn't watching it that day, I, I what? Yeah, I wonder if such Star a, Wars was. Yeah, go- such a famous line that you know it's it's in the back of George's mind. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I I love it. I I love this character. I love the fact that that you know she has the potential to survive, but she's just so strong. She's so passionate. She's um, you know there's that great line. Um, where John looks at her and asks, are you scared, my lady? And yeah. she says, no, let him be scared of me. I mean, she's, you know, she's walking into this marriage and this kind of really scary time for her. I mean, her family's after her. Um, she has given valuable information to John to, to help Stannis. Um, so she's, if, if the Boltons win, there's the potential that, you know, she could suffer because of that. I mean, she's put a lot on the line here and, and that's, that's, that's a big risk for a a woman in this society. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you can definitely see how, uh, she reminds John of, um, Arya. Oh yeah, Um, definitely. Yeah, she uh, is quite the character i love her even more every time i read john 9 and 10 and yeah. surprisingly there's so much about her and she's only in two chapters that's right she yeah presumably leaves for a car hold soon after that yeah I could, in a couple hundred then i could i could see her and uh asha getting along too oh yeah, boy that yeah. would be there <laughs> <laughs> they would not get up to any good <laughs> <laughs> you know she i think that that if she survives she could be a very important ally um to sansa um yes you know especially if sansa well i think we all think she's going to become queen but um if she um if she creates a separate kingdom i mean alice i think would be an integral part in um, supporting sansa and, and again pushing 
their society forward. Um, yeah. Especially with all the wildlings that are going to resettle in the north. Um, I mean, that's that's definitely, I yeah. think, something that Sansa will, will pursue. Uh, I think pers- Alice and Sigorn are one of those. I think they're one of those first steps towards that unification between the Northmen and the northern Northmen. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the more Northmen. The more Northmen, yeah. Northern or Northmen. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, I think that wraps up our discussion of Alice Karstark, a real fan favorite uh, minor character who we we really hope has a long and happy life with Sigourn. Uh, We want to thank you all again for joining us. Um, Please rate and review us on iTunes and other podcasting platforms. Follow us on Twitter at Planetos Podcast. Follow us on Instagram. Like our Facebook page. And uh, we hope everyone is continuing to stay safe and healthy out there. And so uh, yep. until, until next time, we'll see you around Planetos. All right. Have a good one, everyone.